So what would your recruitment scene look like? It'd be really long. Um, oh, good. From the so, planet of Northampton. The planet of Northampton. They'd find me mid-battle uh, with the local <laughs> crowd of the only bakers that's still open and hasn't turned into a bookies. <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> oh, they'd, they'd be... I mean, they take bets, but they do croissants too. They, <laughs> there's, there's a lot going on there, but the, the croissants <laughs> are... I mean, the croissants are rolls. Uh, yeah. And they've got cheese in, so they're like, well, you know, like in when in France, and you're like, oh, well, it's not quite, I don't know. Excuse, don't know this excuse me, mate, can I have a croissant? And he gets, says, yeah, mate, and he gets a cheese roll, just twists it. <clears throat> twists it and then hands it to you in, in like, mincingly. It goes like, uh, just like the French. Uh, it's, it's, it's really, <laughs> it's really unpleasant, actually. But yeah, so, so I'm there. It's a horrible planet. I'm, I'm, I'm mid this scene ar- arguing about, um, you know, the nature of a croissant. And, um, <laughs> and you're like, oh, that's an interesting side story. I wonder if they're going to explore that. And it's, uh, it's too late because it's in slow motion now. So you can't hear anything of what's being said. And <clears throat> basically, you know the music that's been playing for the previous hour and 15 minutes? Oh, yeah. That, yeah it's been that's, droning. Yeah, that's, that's playing again. And I, oh, finally, shit, son. I finally get my croissant the, exactly the way I want. And that allows you to leave the planet of Northampton in search of the, your next adventure. Not just yet, mate. <gasps> Time I sit you down and tell you about my backstory. For you see. Oh, yeah, please. Yeah, for you see. <clears throat> Podcast that well, that's funny. I don't remember any line of dialogue from this movie. All right, let's just quickly Google some lines of dialogue. The podcast that never set foot on the wrong side of history. Yeah, yeah, I think I remember uh, Channing Tatum or whatever it is saying that. Yeah, I'll do. Perfect. I'm Paul. That's funny. I can't remember any character names from this movie. Yeah. Let's Google it again. I'm Paul Bloodaxe. Yeah, that's stupid. Ooh. Paul Bloodaxe. Nice. I relish the ecstasy of combat. I remember that one. Hooray. Oh, yeah, that bit from one of the... Oh, from the flashback scene. I love that scene. Oh, yes. The the flashback scene. Yeah, it was like the nightmare. We are looking at some of the worst films of the last six months. God, Why was, better to begin it? than with Zack Snyder's 2023 made-for-Netflix space opera, Rebel Moon Part 1, A Child of Fire. Ugh. Fuck. That was the full title, including the anguish scream. <laughs> What do you think they want? Everything. So you, you enlist chat GPT to do all your things and that's what you get. You get the inclusions of the <laughs> moans of pain from punters. It was actually a very useful experience for me filming Rebel Moon Part 1, A Child of Fire. Oh! <laughs> Um, I took a lot from the experience um, uh, Don't worry, the audience usually provides the groan for you um, Apparently mm. Snyder originally conceived of the idea in college Yeah, I'd um. write something this stupid at college Yeah Did He, he had one draw with uh, Sucker Punch in it <laughs> The other one, Rebel Moon daddy gave him His daddy gave him when he wrote it when he was at college <laughs> He's like, Poli- polish this up, son <laughs> I reckon you could end some careers with it Not yours, of course No no, just anyone with any promise. <laughs> and Charlie Hunnam. Uh, he... <laughs> oh, old Charlie Hunnam. I, I like, uh, I, you know, I like him as a thing. I do. I like him as a bloke. He's, he's all right. I'm not a hundred percent sure. <laughs> oh, but I like him. Who, who knows I liked, anymore? I liked him in that. Oh, what was it called? The Land of Z, the Lost City of Z. Oh yeah, I haven't seen that. Hunnam, Hunnam. I, liked, I liked him in Nine Gentlemen. I've not seen Nine Gentlemen. Mm. Is that the sequel to Nine Women, the um, <laughs> François Ozon film? Yeah, finally. We've heard all the women's side, but what about the blokes? They've been near, nice, near silent for years now. Hey, I don't know if it was François Ozon or if it was Jacques Audouard. 
The problem is I didn't even, you said the name and my brain didn't even register it as anything I needed to hold on to, so. Oh, let me try nine fa- Uh, Nerf Farm. Eight women? Fuck off. Oh. And, it and, was Ozon, but it was eight the whole time. Oh, I'm and a I, disgrace. And I was saying thine, like T-H-I-N-E, so. Oh. Yeah, you see. Have I, thine gentleman. Oh, I see the gentleman. The, the gentleman, Norman. I, I forget. Well, Not there you go, either. folks. That's the kind of searing insight that you come to this podcast for. <laughs> Neither one of us <laughs> able to understand the either. <laughs> it's that chemistry. Or, or even, our own, for 12 or even years. our own references <laughs> cutting each other off. <laughs> Sheerly incomprehensible to ourselves. Yeah. We're oh, back, everyone. Anyway. Zack Snyder <laughs> pitched the film to Lucasfilm uh, as a Star Wars film and then to Warner Brothers as a Warner Brothers film. You know, people say a lot of harsh things about Disney and Warner Brothers, but maybe they aren't so bad after all. <laughs> the bar's pretty uh, low already, but not that low. Uh, Snyder has recently found a home at Netflix, having similarly mm. released his last two movies directly there, The Equally Risible, Army of the Dead, and Army of Thieves. Great. Oh, Army yep. of Thieves was Zack Snyder as well. Okay. Yes, it was. That's good. Yeah, it is good. His other most recent film, Zack Snyder's Justice League, was also released straight to a streaming service, HBO Max, Mm. so maybe he's given up on cinemas. You know, people say a lot of harsh things about the pandemic and the inevitable decline of the cinematic experience. Silver linings. (laughs) Silver linings playbook. Zack Snyder. Yeah, exactly. That was good. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, there you go. So there you go. Yeah. So there There you you go. Yeah, no, Zack Snyder and Adam Sandler, if, you know, they just stay there. Yeah, they are floating through digital space very much like the bad guys from Superman 2. Stuck in that weird, that thing. And so I feel I feel good about the death of cinema now. Relatively vindicated, if, if nothing else. If all your friends are dying, at least two yeah. <laughs> at least other blokes are dying. Too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the film was written by Snyder and Kurt Johnstad and Shay Hatton. And they've both worked with Snyder before, but not on the same films, strangely. Oh. Uh, and they both have interesting solo credits. John Stad helped adapt 300. Um, and away from Snyder, he wrote Act of Valor, that stupid war movie with real veterans in it. Uh, what? <laughs> thank you for your service. Jesus. Um, you remember Act of Valor? I feel like that's around the era we were seeing. Actually, no, you might have been China bound. And I don't imagine that would have played. <laughs> no. <the> US Army. <laughs> no, I was probably starring in some documentary. Uh... <laughs> About the the, chi- the brilliance of Chinese soldiers and stuff, <laughs> and the weakness, the accurate depiction of the weakness of the of the English. I played I played a weak white man, so uh, there you go. <laughs> Look out for they that. Really specified that they wanted their most sickly looking <laughs> uh, English teachers, and then they they just a the man for you. <laughs> they made a new role especially for me. They couldn't previously <laughs> conceive of such levels of sickliness. They rewrote their history even. <laughs> it was unbelievable, but they did it. Um, yes, uh, yes, and also wrote Atomic Blonde. Oh, so there you go. okay. Well, I mean, I, 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 I say I say that as if I really liked Atomic Blonde. I, I really liked uh, I really liked aspects of it. True. I don't remember the screenplay being one of those key aspects that I no. enjoyed about Atomic Blonde. So. No, I wasn't in there going, oh, look at those fucking words." What's going to happen next? <laughs> oh my god, I can't believe how well developed these characters are. Eddie Marson? This is ridiculous. <laughs> Get out of here. Hatton, meanwhile, wrote oh. the Army of the Dead and Army of Thieves uh-huh. uh, movies for Snyder, but also wrote John Wick's chapters three and four. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Consequences. Some... <laughs> There's consequences going on. I mean, yeah. Um, Again, mate. Yeah. Again. You're not there going, <laughs> fuck, this script's good. Well, I like the world building, and that feels like something that miraculously short of in this particular film. So <laughs> I guess when they need to develop anything other than a hotel. Yeah, it's very much it's world scaffolding tricky. in Rebel Moon, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, they'll fill in the gaps is, later with all the web comics. Is there a building behind this scaffolding? Shut up. <laughs> Just live in it. You're not even real live builders. Me. Yeah, no, look, get him out, love. Uh, that's pretty builder-esque. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I felt pretty objectified there. All right, fine, as you were. <laughs> I can't believe how licenses are given out in this city, this hellscape. Anyway, 
Here's a sentence from the Wikipedia. <laughs> Following concerns from Netflix, films chairman Scott Stuber uh, <laughs> that the project would underperform due to its length, Snyder, unwilling to lose all the character, decided to split the film into two parts. Presumably those bits are all in the second part. Or are they in the bit in between the two parts? <laughs> will it come back and they will have all bonded over the summer we can only hope we can only but... hope because i don't want to experience any of that thank you i'm here for the sick action oh shit yeah i would have liked it as a four and a half hour fucking marathon man <laughs> just to get what to get just to get it all out the way um in one go just to get it all in me i could have lived in this universe i found it so intoxicating wow it, it, imagine rebel moon but the length of fanny and alexander <laughs> imagine that imagine choosing not to do fanny alexander in favor of rebel moon <laughs> imagine having a an thought. objective decision you could have just seen imagine... fanny and alexander and then not and watching rebel moon instead the star wars i would have been in favor of that oh yeah now look i'm desperately trying to do three men at the same time but the film was received by critics like being on the wrong side of history Oh, okay. uh, Chloe Slockery mm -hmm. at The Independent said, oh, yeah. with Rebel Moon Part 1, A Child of Fire, oh, <laughs> uh, Zack Snyder promised a more mature take on Star Wars. Unfortunately, it's more Star Wars for people who think those movies are too political and don't feature enough sexual violence. This is not the first time Snyder has directly tied female empowerment to sexual assault, see Sucker Punch, yeah. among others. Mm -hmm. And despite the film featuring a prominent non-binary character played by a non-binary actor, E. Duffy, it's also not the first time a supposed layer of degeneracy has been depicted as explicitly queer-coded. C-300. Pretty yeah. solid takedown there of Snyder and his uh, use of objectification. What have I told you? Various projects. About quoting people who <laughs> adequately sum up the issues of this movie in a way that we are Look. physically incapable of. <laughs> Clarice Lottery has not even begun to engage with just how fucking lazy this film is. And that mm. is where we come in. As long as she doesn't so engage with how lazy we are. Oh God! If she ever did that, we'd be do we'd be doomed. We'd be doomed. We'd be doomed. Um, tell you what, though, not all critics chose to be on the wrong side of history, though. Mm. Uh, noted contrarian, former enfant terrible film critic, now conservative reactionary crank Armand White, in okay. his review for the National Review titled Great. "Rebel Moon: A Star Wars for Grown Ups," <clears throat> a direct, direct uh, supplication to uh, Clarice Lockery and her <laughs> mighty powers, says. <laughs> Snyder's char characteristic interest in spiritual, erotic, kinetic pop culture mythology serves revenge, but as a vision. Rebel Moon resembles numerous uh, familiar sci-fi adventures tales, but very few have had comparable energy or imagination, or displayed such an ineffable cinematic knack. Snyder has that gift. His imagery unites ideas from Terek Malick's A Hidden Life with Walter Hill's Geronimo, an American legend, the lyrical, the hostile, plus the historic, and he achieves visual kinetic, though he used yeah he used the word kinetic three times. Uh, okay. Excitement kinetically that George that George Lucas, Peter Jackson, and the Wachowskis should envy. Okay, so energy he used energy energy uh, and also knack kinetic. and knack. Oh yes, none of these words kinetic included. <laughs> no. <laughs> Oh, poor the energy of Rebel Moon. Oh, oh. made me miss Laudanum. What's the antithesis of, of sluggish? It's that. <laughs> it's beaverish. It beavered away at my genitals until I felt thoroughly included in all the things that Zack Snyder was doing. Nor uh, gnawed away like an horrific contracted disease. His subsequent review of Furiosa noted uh, that George Miller lacked the uh, sort of panache and... Uh, what's the word he used? Sort of uh, mythicism of... Uh, uh, Zack Snyder and his Rebel Moon. So uh, the the thing is, you you introduce this critic as um <laughs> as as somebody with a history, uh, and yes. I hadn't heard of him before, and it sounds like I've heard of him too late. Um, it <laughs> sounds like yes, he, he can was... just fuck off. He can do that. He is very noted for being very <sighs> controversial. In his okay. writing. He has written some good stuff in the past. It has been a while. I have tried to engage with some of his reviews recently and found that he is given to hyperbole mm. in a way that I find unhelpful. Yeah. I... And he's also a conservative crank. I, d I don't know what it is about sort of punks from the 80s and 90s turning into conservative cranks, but there was uh, like at some point and like the anti-establishment line didn't mm. turn, didn't 
curve around with the rest of the rest of civilization and they've just cut a line mm. straight through where they think that I don't, I don't yeah i don't know look at johnny rotten look at john cleese all these absolutely well, eventually you've got money cunts. eventually you've got money and you're old so you don't like all the new things yeah. that are happening all the new Although, ideas i must say i am working on a theory in which john cleese has actually always been a cunt but yeah. very few in academic institutions have been willing to fund me thus far thus far but they haven't heard it on this episode yet so um yeah i mean johnny rotten yeah, has also not ever been like a particularly great person so <laughs> maybe oh Sorry, I've written more. He goes on oh. to claim that George Lucas was unable to build a substantial mythos from Star Wars and that Snyder finally realises the sci-fi genre's artistic potential, concluding the way Zack Snyder does action and sensual mythology gives Rebel Moon the touch of a visual poet and makes it a victory. Sensual mythology is something that your uncle would say, the uncle that you wish would leave you alone and stop trying to hug you. <laughs> the one who's super into Vikings. <laughs> <laughs> Look, America has to define its own mythology, and I think it's finally found one worthy of it. Yeah. Anyway. Public, meanwhile, we're happy to be on the wrong side of history. Okay. Nitim Vinod at Google said, Zack Snyder's latest sci-fi epic, Rebel Moon, with the director's signature bombastic visuals and operatic storytelling, is a love letter to classic space operas like Star Wars and Seven Samurai, infused with Snyder's distinct slow-motion action sequences epic world building and larger than life characters it's a large mate i did tune out halfway through that but then i came back with um <laughs> kurosawa or seven samurai and i remember reading a review that also mentioned the on the sleeve sort of influence of kurosawa oh sure and, and I went, yeah and and i thought to myself no not even gonna <laughs> honor it with that i just didn't didn't do that well enough to it for it to even be obvious for me but I, I know, I know um, if to people who are more cine literate, you'll probably pick, pick up on it. But I think it was just not even good enough to be clear on that. I do want this to fuck off. That person then continues their review oh. with the following headings. A visual stunning galaxy, a Snyder's slow motion symphony, and a symphony of interests. <laughs> a kinetic symphony of symphony, symphonic kineticness. <laughs> It sure I, was, mate. That's what I like most about it. I love how slow it was, Paul. I think I think the slower the better where this movie was. Could this just be half an hour uh, longer, but with like the fast bit slower? Oh, that was Corey Stoll. Fuck me. Well, who wrote that, that review? <laughs> also, I think Corey <laughs> Stoll was really good in this. LOL jokes. <laughs> oh, God, I knew I recognised this stupid face from somewhere. Yeah. It's from being Modoc. Yeah. <laughs> And other things, but mostly Modoc. Mostly Modoc. Look, I've been trying to do the three men, and I've just realised now that I haven't been writing down where the people have come from. Just so say the names, Dan- Well, Dan- Well, okay, so Bonnie Morgan and Brandon Orette, but I-, I could do the subsequent ones because Daniel Bergio was in Ghosts of Mars and Showgirls, Ooh. which is a wonderful collection. That's a spread. Uh, Derek-, Derek Mears was in Hansel and Gretel and Wild Wild West, a wiki wow wow. That's a great too. <laughs> uh Jamon Hounsu is a three man. Hello, oh. sir, because of Serenity and Black Adam. Ugh. Oh, that's a shame. That is a shame. It also means that Jamon is one of the very few people who crossed the Marvel DC line. Oh, Probably not very few people. Hooray. I don't know anymore. No, um, I, I refuse to know anymore. Um is just ben a two Affleck min- like the new Spider Man? Could be. <laughs> Why not? Who fucking cares anymore? Love. <laughs> The president. Uh, the, uh, giant one only a two minute in my heart because I haven't seen Black Adam yet. And I say yeah, oh, as if well. uh, that's just on my to, to, get there, to watch mate. pile. Oh yeah, one of these After days. All your the rock. You'll <laughs> yeah. swing around to it. I'll come home from Lestrada uh, and go, oh, I could watch, uh, rewatch some of the uh, the Park Chan Wooks that I've just bought. I could watch Into Shable. Or I could <laughs> just put on Black Adam again. Fuck it. I hate myself. Or I could just watch it. I could just watch a big bunch of shite. Just download um, the Warner Brothers streaming service or whatever and just just, yay. just fucking hate myself until I die. Douglas Tate was in Hellboy and Land of the Lost. Excellent. Mm. Uh, where are you? No, no. The fuck is Land oh, of the Lost? Oh, Malone. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, Jenna Malone. Land of the Lost that we watched four minutes of. Yeah. Who was Jenna Malone in this? Well, was, was she the big spider lady that... Um, oh, God, that's that bad. Duna Bay was fighting. Well, she was in Batman vs. Superman for approximately four minutes and was also in uh, Big Sucker Spider Punch. in that as well. And in, and in Sucker Punch. Yeah. <laughs> that Peter's guy insisted. <laughs> um, 
Mark Steger was in The Last Wachanta and The Nun. Ooh. So many I appreciate that interesting spread. backstories in, in, uh, <laughs> in, in these I'd folks. I'd love to have had time to have a little look at who, what they were, who they played in these things. But, you know, time... Time is a cruel mistress, and I'm I'm her bitch. We already spent two uh, and a half hours watching this film, Rebel Moon, Part One: A Child of Fire. Ow! Unprepared to do more than that. Yeah. Uh, Richard Citroni or Citrone mm-hmm. was in Batman vs Superman: Ghosts of Mars and Sucker Punch. Oh, two Don't Ghosts of Marses. Just a two minute Sophie Patella because of the mummy. We'll get there, guys. Jenny. Uh, <laughs> Jenny, and that's it. Well, hey, that's Who... a three man. That's a three man, everyone. That's a three minutes, the theme goes. Rebel Moon has 21% on Rotten Tomatoes, 31% on Metacritic, and a mighty two on Letterboxd. But according mm. to Netflix, and a whole billion persons watched it in the first half hour of its release, so there's probably going to be more. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Fuck off. Why? Why, planet Earth? So, Paul, you blood axe. Stop making me help you. I wrote, I don't know where that's from. <laughs> stop, stop helping yourself. No, I was yelling that at uh, me what's... throughout. <laughs> God bless her. What's one thing about Rebel Moon Part One, A Child of Fire, oh, that made you want to be on the wrong side of history? I like how this could be condensed down to a nice music video if you'd never seen one of those before. You might think, oh, this is Snyder a good, story. This is a good puddle of mud video, I reckon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it wasn't. It's a film. It's a two and a half hour film. Oh, no, wait. It's a Zack Snyder joint. <gasps> Zack Snyder story. And therefore, a bold vision of Americana. Yeah. Yeah. So let's let's get into it. Let's get through this bastard because we start with a dick shaped ship emerging yeah. from this big space vagina. No nothing to worry about though. Here's a lovely Welshman to kick things off. Oh boy, so space. It's a so, it's, it's 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 an intro narration, but without the subtitle without any captions or anything for you to read. If there seems like a lot of uh, information to retain, don't worry, as normal. I always need it written down for me and Please. issued to me before I enter the cinema. There's a big empire, but the king and queen are dead. And a non-royal senator, oh, he's he's not got the bloodline. The sacred bloodline, he's some sort of new money. I hate those. I I, I really hate those, unless they're some sort of ubermensch. Um, But they would have been born with it anyway, so that's fine. We can all... They would have been born with some sort of royal lineage. That's all that matters. Yeah. But you can be... I mean, you can be a noble savage, so long as you're willing to die for said noble lineage. Yes. But the important thing is, know your place. And this new King Gygax, or whatever his name is, didn't do that. <laughs> and ran new a place. What? Well, anyway. Um... <laughs> On the benefits line. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um... Um... Yeah. They, the, king, the kingdom is merciless against anyone that would call themselves Jedi. <laughs> no, that's too ominous. <laughs> I mean, Rebels. moons. I mean... As a show of strength, he sent his most brutal commander into the outer reaches of the mother world's dominion to find and crush without mercy those who would call themselves rebel. They don't have a copyright on rebels, do they? Um, I'd like to see them sue me, Zack Snyder. I've got no money. Anyway, they they cut <laughs> they cut to a farmland on, on in space looks that looks original. Farmland. And here we meet Glistening Lass, who's doing uh <laughs> doing a farm work on a desert planet. Oh, I forgot how murky the cinematography is now. Oh Ugh. thank God. Just um Snyder's whole look. Yeah, it's I there. know. I know. It's 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 really good. It's really good for watching a glistening lass do some work and uh, 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 like doing some good manual, doing some good manual work with the boobs flapping about, and um, celebrating that good day's hard work with a good smell of some dirt, which he does for a bit until um, Blandor. I've got. <laughs> yeah, because we're in space, Scandinavia. Oh, good, everybody's white. Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, an underdog I can believe in, and. Everything's perfect, and they all have sex with each other in order to help the harvest or something. Probably. I don't know. Corey Stahl said it. Yeah. Um, yeah, she's been here for two seasons. Here's, yeah. <laughs> Hoping she's for a third. For <laughs> and yet I haven't spoken to you yet, so let me tell you all of my backstory and my concerns. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you. The two seasons I've spent here have given me happiness that I don't deserve. I understand I am a child of war. 
to truly love and be loved, I, I don't know if I'm capable of either. You know me, ever since I was kicked in the head by that, uh, by that plot device. <laughs> Do you want to hear my whole backstory? Ah, we'll eke it out. <laughs> so, but then the Fire Nation attacked. <gasps> Over the summer. The big bad. <laughs> they, they all grew deader because the, um, the Empire, the terrible Empire shows up. In order to do a seven samurai, basically. Yeah. Let's let's try and sell our surplus to them. Uh, they'll probably kill us all. Okay. But all right, we'll we'll, we'll try. But yeah, we'll we'll try. But they might kill us anyway. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what. This empire doesn't, doesn't seem particularly great. They're not very good because they're space Nazis. So don't worry, they're all white too. They're space oh, Nazis. Yeah. And Ed, Ed Screen shows up as the head space Nazi, looking more like a Nazi than he did when he played a Nazi. <laughs> looking the most Nazi-ish yet. And he's brought Zer- Xerxes' Persian army with him. So, Oh, good. God. That's how you know God they're evil. God bless him for that. Yeah. Some very natural lines are said on both sides. Oh, yeah. oh mate. It's an excellent, excellent dialogue sequence. You see, the land is rocky and yields barely enough to feed ourselves. So it is with sincere apologies that we must decline the offer. Huh. No surplus. None at all? Huh. To a land that's so fertile, your fields seem larger than what your population might need. Of course, I understand how it might seem. Yet the scale of the planting is evidence of the poor soil. And our harsh winters only add to the short season. Now, what do you say we share that cup of ale, eh? Sorry. It's just, I mean, look at these beautiful people. I can't imagine these glowing complexions are nourished by a barren field, that's all. Absolutely. I mean, it's a really a meeting of the minds, really. We don't have enough. Looks like you do. We don't. It looks like you do. We don't. It looks like you do. We don't. It looks like you do. We don't. <laughs> How about you? Oh, we've got loads. Yeah. Bang, dead. Yeah. Bang, dead, but not so... the, the, not Mr. I've got loads. It was Corey Stoll. Yeah. Mr. We've got nothing. Injustice. The injustice. Yeah. Who'd have thought that they'd have gotten rid of Corey Stoll and not obviously the leading man of the, the movie. Um, oh. Humble farmer, Cristiano Ronaldo. <laughs> God bless him for that. Yeah. I've called him Ellis. Yeah. Because he tried to make things better and got killed immediately. Oh. Uh, so, no, no. I'm a uh, young, attractive gunner who uh, uh, I was referring to. Humble farmer, Cristiano Ronaldo. Mm-hmm. So he doesn't look oh, like wait, a farmer. A... He looks like a model. Uh, is that weirdly? The dead one, or the one who's now... I think we were referring to the same person. The love interest. But I'm... Yes, the love oh. interest. I called him Ellis, because he tried to negotiate, like, Ellis from the Die Hard. Oh, I see. Yeah. I remember Die Hard now. That was a movie. Um, that was a movie you can watch. That was a movie This I... is our most sluggish energy yet, and we've got to do something. We, we, we've got to do something. I just want to I just want to point out... Well, no, I just want to establish that I was calling this guy Blandor to begin with. Um, okay. and I'm happy to stick with Blandor because Blandor's fine. It's going to save me. We can time. go with that until I find whatever it is I nicknamed him, and then we'll see. We can compare. But fortunately, I won't mention that until he becomes somewhat significant to my notes near the end. Fantastic. Um, until then, there's just a bunch of shite to layer on. Yeah. Oh well. Well, what do we do now? Well, what if we're extra subservient to the Nazis? Then they'll see our worth. Yeah. <laughs> then they'll respect us. It's my approach with women, <laughs> and unfortunately, it's likely to get you as dead as I am. <laughs> so, yeah, because hey, this is worse than Seven Samurai. This time, they're not just a bunch of lawless bandits; they're the government come to take your hard labor. Oh, and your taxes probably. So, yep. um... so it's time we we murdered them all. Yeah. Uh, all right, roughneck. Ooh, ooh, yeah. Unload the Anthony Hopkins robot. <laughs> I am JC1435 of the Mechanicus Militarium, Defender of the King. Correction, of the Slain King. <laughs> yeah, <Ooh>. why? <laughs> what, sir? Oh, he's gone. He's he gone. can carry the weight of a large man. <laughs> and his accent's just adorable. Oh, it's, it's wonderful, mate. But these used to be killer robots. They used to be killer robots. <laughs> Anthony Hopkins' dulcet tones used to be the last thing you heard. You got your <laughs> fucking head caved in. 
It occurs to me that not everybody's reference for Anthony Hopkins as the remains of the day and finds that idea humorous. <laughs> At least some people will probably have seen the slightly more famous Silence of the Lambs and found how Hopkins as a murderer less incredible. True, but not this this brand of Hopkins, not the father Hopkins. Um, <laughs> this it, robot should have had Hannibal energy as well. Maybe it used to, Paul, but never mind, because oh. compared to the fucking South African army they've got in now. <laughs> South African Scottish Nazis is what we're dealing with. <laughs> There's a lot going on. Some, some uh, horrendous accents uh, and um, lots of, oh, uh, what, what, what would you call it? Um, typical shit from a fucking Zack Snyder movie. Uh, pl- <laughs> plenty of objectification. Uh, don't worry, there will be a sexual assault soon. Uh, and no, it isn't going to get in the way of seeing a good pair of jugs. Oh, good. Thanks. Well, look, there's an innocent blonde blue-eyed woman and uh, an Aryan stereotype who is of yeah. course one of the oppressed as she, are all white people these days am I right she's very pure Paul she's very pure and, and beautiful therefore good and um therefore good because of how beautiful she is yes so yeah she's nice to Anthony Hopkins robot mm. oh you're nice let me tell you my backstory oh. tell me Sam do you know the story of our slain king and his beautiful daughter the princess Issa I don't well you remind me of her. Get back uh, and Anthony Hopkins robots just trying to jam a screwdriver in its own circuitry. <laughs> just, just let me die. <laughs> I've watched for so long. I was in the Elephant Man. So, <laughs> yes, Butella plans to leave. Yeah. But an old man approaches her in order to tell her some of her backstory. <laughs> God. When I found you in the wreckage of that ship, I considered leaving you. I was afraid you could bring trouble to us. But do I for a moment regret bringing you into our lives? I do not. Fuck me. You might need this on so, the road. <laughs> with all that in mind, please throw a seven samurai for us. But they don't do it until the Nazis threaten to uh, assault the uh, innocent supermodel. Yeah. And uh, also hurt the boy who not, was also on the farm. Not the good boy um, who was also a the soldier, but a good boy. Oh, Despite so... not having blonde hair. <gasps> there you go. Well, there you go. Determinism not... affects us all. Some of my best friends aren't incredibly Aryan. So, <laughs> the teller decides to easily kill them all. Yeah. Oh. Well, I imagine she'll just continue to do that throughout the film then. But no, there's stakes. There's a mm. tremendous amount of peril and she has to go and recruit back up urgently. Or she might not be able to do exactly that again, but more yeah. so. What was that? Backstory, mate. No, no, no. <sighs> Got another one. Ah, oh, shit. Glenn Powell decides to come too, I've called him. What are we calling him? <laughs> oh, I've got Blandor. <laughs> Blandor's fine. So they sit around the fire, and she tells him some more of her backstory. Thank God. Turns out Thanos happened to her. Belisarius killed my entire family and took me with him. I don't know why he spared me. Why, of the hundreds of thousands that died at his hands, he chose me to live. Yeah, it's Thanos. Uh... It's Thanos. With a couple more scenes. That... Well, a few more scenes. Brilliant. She was in the army until, you know, she wasn't. Yeah. And then he came out. So, <laughs> oh, they were encouraged to find lovers so that they would have someone to fight for. Didn't that massively fuck up their objectivity on the battlefield, as evidenced by <laughs> their near both murder in the very next scene? <laughs> uh, no, shut up. Uh, look, this is a failing empire. It's decadent and it's outrageous. Yeah. Look. So. I've got... Uh, my next note here is slow motion for 20 seconds, real speed for 5 seconds, slow motion for 45 seconds. End. That could have been End of any point of the movie. <laughs> yeah. So, they travel to the first settlement, which is a bar planet. And um, Blandor gets sexually assaulted, but it's funny. Yeah, I was going to say, I hope there's a fucking pervert in here. Oh, no, good! Oh, boy! Someone codified queer for us to be horrified by and then get watch get killed. Yeah. That's what I come to a Zack Snyder film for. I hate all of this, but Charlie Hunnam's here with his accent. I don't like bounty hunters. I didn't ask. And to be clear, I don't like bounty hunters either. So you're a gun for hire? No, that's not my thing. I'm more of an opportunist, you might say. And he isn't Aragorn. He's definitely not Aragorn, don't worry about that. And they have a bad action scene and all leave together. That's pretty much going to be the pattern of the movie yeah. for the next hour. Slow motion for 30 seconds, real time 5 seconds, slow motion 15 uh. seconds, real time 3 seconds, slow mo for the rest of the scene. 
And Charlie Hunnam has a top knot. And he's Irish. Oh, dear. So he's definitely not Aragorn. I don't know why everyone keeps saying that. Why do you think he's out? out, Wait, did I miss a deleted scene at the end of Return of the King where Aragorn just betrayed them all? (laughs) Just sold them the fuck out to uh, um, to Sauron. Because I'd be behind that. The Snyder Cut, mate. It's like, it turns out you shouldn't have trusted the face of man after all. They really were too greedy. Elrond had us right down pat. Yeah. But look, I love the way the guns shoot CGI goo that has no impact on the environment. It's very good. Ooh. Very strong. I... But yes, Hunnam. Yeah. Hunnam's aware of another bad action scene they can go to. So. Oh, yeah. brilliant. We can go and re- recruit a guy in Boring Planetville. Uh, and <laughs> So they do. They go and f- find well, this man and uh, they, have to, they have to get him to get a thing. Uh, but he has to get a thing done. To, in order to go with them, and they do it. It's almost impossible to remember which scene that is, but... <laughs> yeah, oh, he has to tame do... a big bird, mate. Oh, it's the bird one, okay. Yeah. Uh, before that, we do check in with our rich and compelling villains. Uh, Love those guys. Great. Great, lost learn there. Okay, yes, <laughs> on to Jason No Noah. That's it. He's... Good, good stuff. I got, I got Broman the Brabarian. Broman the Barbarian Brown <laughs> is perfectly fine. <laughs> and yeah, please go outside and do an avatar on the Harry Potter beast we're keeping outside. Yeah, I wrote uh, okay. avatar, avatar, Khaleesi. That's, that'll do. That's yeah, the scene. Khaleesi at the end. Yep. It's good stuff. It's finally Zack Snyder's yeah. here to put originality back into the movies. Anyway, we get to the end of the scene. Uh, this was good, says Sophia Batella. Anyone else that could be on the team? <laughs> do you, can we do that again? Yeah. Just that exact same sequence? Yeah, sure. <laughs> we already have a big, slightly simple ethnic guy, Irish comedic relief. So I think now we could have a vaguely mystical Asian sword fighter. Oh, cool. Oh, come on, Duna Bay. <laughs> You're better oh, than this, Duna Bay. Dan Coriader. <laughs> You're in great cl- in next Suhi. You're in, <laughs> You're in Cloud Atlas. Oh. oh, yeah, and Jupiter Ascending. Oh, yeah. Oh, well. uh, so I've got Duna Bay, Jabba. Fucking samurai cop. Uh, I don't know if you saw yeah. that, Charlie Hunnam's uh, longer than necessary reaction scene <laughs> to Duna Bay's action. <laughs> Love that. I didn't notice that. It's very I good. Believe in it. Jenna the Malone. But I tell you what, Jenna Malone's Spider Woman would have been a way more interesting addition to the team, but you know, we're, we're looking for bland here. We need someone who will just fit right into the background. So, yeah. Duna Bay has a laser sword, mate. They're like lightsabers, yeah. but they're better It's because they have yeah, more visual just... effects. I love that. I love them about them and how unnaturally they fit into the scene. At this stage, during my 70 millimeter exhibition of Rebel Moon last Christmas at the Prince Charles, I went angrily to the bathroom <laughs> and seriously considered not coming back. What what brought you back, I was mate? So bored. Honor. I d- decided I would come back, and the very next thing that really pissed me off, I would leave. And unfortunately, <laughs> once you've got this far into the story, you've kind of experienced most of the worst of what this movie has in store for you. Yeah, it's just apathy uh, after this. Um, yes. And this is reflected yes. in my notes. Um, they, but, but yeah, they, they, they recruit Duna Bay. They say, wow, you did it. That's awesome. No, it's not, says Duna Bay. It's very sad and cool, but sad. And I shouldn't be enjoying this. I'll have some cool, sad things to say in part two, I imagine. Great. So, they arrive at the Gladiator Arena to recruit Jamon Houndsu. More backstory on the way. For my loyalty and service, I was promoted to the elite guard of the royal family. The appointment was engineered by my father. I couldn't have known him was something more. Let me guess, an action scene? Oh no, a dialogue sequence. Well, what? that'll be fun. So they yell, each, they yell at each other about his backstory. <laughs> General! Stop calling me that. I have no rank, no privilege. I'm here to make you an offer. To give you a chance at redemption. I am beyond redemption. I have no time for pity. What about all the dead men you once commanded? What about them? If not redemption, what about revenge? And then he joins. Well, he's very sad, you see. But Glistening Lass is also very sad. So She's very glistening and very sad. Yeah. Um, And, uh... Yeah? Yeah. They go to fucking Gong of... Gunga Land, whatever it's called, to speak yep, to Jupiter Naboo. Ascending. Yeah. Yep, to speak to Squid Man. Yeah. And yeah, the rebels are going to come here soon, so I guess you best settle down. Maybe you can explore this world, or talk to me, a weird new character, or talk to each other and bond. Oh, here they are. Yeah, here they are. Here's Cyborg. <laughs> Here's two bland characters and a handful of sand soldiers. Yeah. We're calling them dead and meat. Nice. Yeah. Lovely, lovely, so, oh, lovely rustic, simple names. 
Ah. Uh, well, yeah. Charlie Hunnam has a go at explaining some of his backstory. Uh. Guilt. It's a powerful thing. I guilt. The underbelly of honor. I think I might have had that once. Honor. Do you believe that? And they have a nice character moment. Ah, oh, I wonder why. Wait, why? Why are they <laughs> having a moment to develop Charlie Hunnam here and the relationship he has with this with Sophie Patella? You've literally done that with no one else in this movie. Is something about to happen? I can't. I can't figure out why. I'm too apathetic. I've become so numb. <laughs> I'm just taking this into my veins. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah. Uh, Ed Screen, the Nazis back. Um. Uh, yep, he kills Squid Guy for being weak, damn it. Yeah. And charitable. Which, yeah. You know, and... it's, hard, it's hard to imagine Zack Snyder putting that into the v- mouths of a bad guy when previously he would have put that into the mouth of Superman. <laughs> yeah. It's it's hard to remember things when you know things or the other way around. I forget which. I'm watching a Zack Snyder movie. Um, they The the Nazis have a very cool exit strategy where they blow up the planet just as their, uh, their most important guy is getting onto a ship and leaving the planet. Oh, it's yeah. Very cool, which is how you know they're evil. Um, uh, and Ram people done dying it. in that explosion would have loved that before they died. Like, oh, fucking na- and whether they'd have said Nazis or nice, you just you're never gonna know. But ah, oh, fucking Nazi. <laughs> so Nazis more like they go to the trade depot. <laughs> but oh no, Hunnam has betrayed them. But they have that nice scene. What? No, he was nice. Literally, the only time we've seen two characters interact and not explain backstory. He can't have betrayed her, but he did. <laughs> and so all the disposable soldiers are killed, as are dead and meat. Yeah. Uh, to no reaction from anyone. No. Well, you know. Don't know. That that was the end of that sentence. Um, that was the end. Yeah. I swear to God that Beastmaster, Samurai Lady, and Jamon Hounzu haven't had a line since they were recruited. Well, that's how you know that they're allies, mate. If they start if they start talking to one another, fucking one of them's gone to the Nazis. They have an intuitive understanding. Anyway, they all get captured. Yeah, and, and then they uh, get free. Yeah. Oh, ha! one of the bland dudes is called Commander Bloodaxe. <laughs> uh, you know, there's a moment in Furiosa where a guy says, I don't do anything unless Octoboss says so. And then they cut to a dude who hasn't been introduced by name yet, but you just look at him and you know that that's Octoboss. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't quite work with Commander Bloodaxe. Oh, fucking but... Fucking dude in a shirt. But fucking Iggy Pop, the film critic, mate, he said that this was better than <laughs> Mad Max. So. It's, be- it's better than anything you've ever seen before, and I love that. Screen goes around and reminds everybody of their backstories. I can't believe we have this scene, Paul. I can't believe this is a scene in this film. Even this, for, even for this fucking what film, we learned. <laughs> it, it, this will be he on the test. He he just he announces that um, Butella was previously known as Scar Giver, which is lame, and also implies that most of the people she fought survived. Yeah, and is this gonna? That, is that the name of the second part? Yeah. Good. Well, for not the unrated bit, that's got brand new subtitles that I couldn't give a fuck about. Oh, whatever. Um, Hooray! <laughs> and on to the next bit. Uh, you there, Blandor, take this weapon and definitely kill Butella with the only bullet that's inside it and not me. I'll stand yeah. here next to you. <laughs> Unprepared. Um, <laughs> Guard down. You haven't killed anyone before, right? Yeah, okay, cool. So. Yeah, you'll be fine. Yeah. Um, uh, boom is what I've written next. Blam! Rat a tat tat tat. Uh, imagine if in Star Wars everyone didn't want to use their powers but did anyway because they had to. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, God. Uh, the burden. The burden of being amazing. Oh, so, God, it's amazing. They escape and there's 15 minutes of bollocks. Yeah, Cyborg and, dies, uh, but we win because of Cyborg and his sacrifice. Yep. Yay, Commander Bonehammer, I called him, and I'd have loved to have riffed on his stupid name some more, but this is literally the third thing he's done in the movie. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. It is truly ridiculous that Zack Snyder tries to feel you as hard, make you feel it as hard as he does. As hard as he tries to feel you. <laughs> Um, <laughs> he's for, trying to fill you through the screen. He is. That that is that oh. is genuinely or generally rather, but also genuinely how that feels. It feels like I'm being groped by his fucking wandering eyes. Um, uh, Ned, Nazi head screen and glistening lass have a fight, and it almost goes wrong, they but do, it doesn't. Finally, yeah. Finally, these two titans meet after their scene together. <gasps> a jewel of the fates. If you will. Well, actually, Jewel of the Face had a similar amount of build up to it. <laughs> well, no, well, yes, no, that's exactly my point. 
Stupid. Oh, shit. Stupid. It's wonderful. All of it. It's brilliant. I loved it. The battle ends. Yeah. One of the planned soldiers lived and will be a character in the next movie where hopefully she'll get. they will get some character time. Oh, my God. Nanoa says something bland about keeping a hold of the dead. Hanzu says something obvious about how it's actually good that they won. <laughs> actually. Actually, it turns out this might have repercussions that will be beneficial to the cause. Oh, that's nice then. This is a, this all seems <sighs> thoroughly fucking pointless. Ha ha ha, says Jaimon Hounsou. <laughs> you would think that. You would. And then there's a ra- robot wearing some antlers. Oh, yay, they return home. And a character says something, and another character reacts non-verbally to what has just been said. Yeah. The most spectacular and subtle piece of storytelling in the film. And yeah, Anthony Hopkins... H- Anthony Botkins! <laughs> <gasps> Literally Ant- the first time he's been in the movie. Ant- Antlery Botkins. Ah... Uh, Antlery Botkins. <laughs> we'll remember, he ends the movie. We'll remember that for part two. <laughs> well, our notes shall be just about as coherent. Oh, and Ed Screen survived. Oh, dear. Oh, yeah, so he did. Oh, it's like a, it's like a comic book movie. Uh, it's exactly like that. That's how it played. That's how I experienced it. Oh, God. <laughs> that was draining. Yeah. This episode is very much an extension of that film. Um, it, <laughs> I'm off to see La Strada in an hour, and I'm very grateful. Yes, it's it's going to be lovely. Uh, I, I'm I I couldn't imagine I couldn't conceive of a more perfect antidote per, and yeah antidote antithesis. Yeah, thing that I need to keep me sane and rem- remember that cinema is good and pure. This, okay, mate. Let's start with the positives. Oh, because I've, I'll 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 likely forget them. Okay. Once we get started, I, um, I genuinely don't think I have any. So this is going to be a very you-oriented f- segment. I'm happy with that. It's going to take about ten seconds. I I, I think. <laughs> it, kudos i always have respect for ambition and scope and for daring to take his sweet fucking time with each scene and you see in that last sentence there that swerved from praise into uh the beginning of what uh we're going to call the general like the thoughts segment of this sure. episode um and, and i could see i could see within all of that stuff that was going on there was potential for for something if anyone else would have written it directed it uh you know anything that any involvement that Zack snyder and his team had was yeah. removed and it was replaced with some other people so mm. and, and that's that is as gracious as i'm willing to be on this because i fucking hated yeah. er, nearly every second of this movie every grudging yeah. drop of of like enjoyment that Zack Snyder's like forces the audience to like in- endure to like gr- ring from this fucking tawdry, boring, meandering, ugly, yeah. oh, God. <laughs> hypocritical, just mm. just bullshit. <laughs> it, this was fucking horrendous, mate. Mm. I, I feel like this is th- th- this is so. I, I hate this for um, all the money and and access and opportunities Zack Snyder has, and to produce something mm. so fucking bland, yeah, and yet so just uh, still I don't know, still feeling so fucking cynical and yeah, and and smug as well. I it hate is. it. It's very hard not to be contemptuous when it does feel so very much like what all of the people who sort of jumped ship from Star Wars and various other uh, franchises for being too woke, yeah. you know, wanted from those franchises. Just utterly bland, grim, dark. Mm. You know, it, it's again an adolescence idea of what um, maturity looks like. Yeah. Now, I've reviewed the film on Jen and the Film Critics, so people can go there and hear me complain about how unoriginal, ugly, and tedious it is. Okay. What I'd like to expand on here is just what a bad storyteller Snyder has proven to be of late. Yes. Because, you know, a completely arbitrary plot just to facilitate production design and action sequences is one... Well, that's a music video, as we said. 
for sure. But it's also, there have been movies that do that. You can argue that against that as underscoring the emotional investment needed to actually engage with any such action sequence. But, you know, to fail to tell such a basic story mm. in an engaging way as Snyder fails here. Yeah. You know, a story that has served Westerns, kids films, comedies, and yeah. yes, even sci-fi type, uh, films before. You know, it's very accessible. You just have to put a crew together, have the crew bond, build the story towards a big action scene near the end yeah. that puts your characters in peril and then pay off everything that they've sort of experienced together. But Snyder has no interest or ability with character. Yeah, His idea of character is backstory, and it's backstories that he has stolen from elsewhere. Mm. And looking back over his filmography, his heroes are all incredibly dull and his villains incredibly simplistic. Mm. You know, stoic is a generous description because it implies some form of inner life or turmoil. You know, to act or not to act is just yeah. a grimace that our hero will pulls before the ne- pull before the next slow motion action scene. Which which really did get out of hand, by the way. The slow motion in oh, this God. is yeah. it's it's. I th- I think I've previously described Zack Snyder's reliance on slow motion as, um, you know parody or it feels like parody but this is this is if like this is if adam sandler was trying to parody Zack snyder the amount of yeah footage the amount of the runtime that was slow motion yeah it, like i can't even it's it's like being asked a stupid question you don't even know where to begin criticizing it because yeah. it sh- like this is so obviously stupid yeah, and every it had the for me it had the Assassin's Creed effect of, you know, somebody actually performed the stunt of diving off of a tower, mm. and Sophia yes. Butella, you know, looked excellent in Kingsman. Um, you know, she's a dancer and how sure. looked very cool, <clears throat> and 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 just the sheer color palette and and the slow mo and the yeah. just the over stylized feel of this movie. Just negated any natural flair she might have had, and yeah. and, and it's 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 so in, inept. The sheer ineptitude mm. of Zack Snyder uh, across like yeah. all aspects of filmmaking. Mm. He's not he's not a good not a good ideas guy. He's not a good um, practical guy. He doesn't execute things well. He doesn't write well. No. There's there's nothing. I don't... I mean, I guess it just appeals to people who are like Zack Snyder. <laughs> I guess so. Because, yeah, it, it... I mean, it goes without saying that I do side with Clarice Lockery on this and not... <gasps> right. That this is, you know, a teenage boy's idea of maturity. Just because you've exploited sexual assault yeah. to try and superficially build stakes whilst yeah. not actually engaging with... I don't know the systems of yeah. like in, that enable sexual assault or the emotional yeah. impact of it yeah. or anything like that it means you're just using it as a shorthand for these guys are bad. Yeah, and using something as fraught for potential audiences. Yeah. Only you know he's not planning for anyone. He, he knows his audience, and they're not going to have sort of any sort of interest in actual experiences of sexual assault. They just recognize it as a thing that's bad yeah and so you can just use it free free freely yeah. without paying any sort of cost for it and <sighs> yeah yeah very tedious it... and snyder's aesthetic did remind me of something and i was thinking of those terrible old sci-fi channel movies or the straight to dvd crowdfunded mm. films like iron sky that you used to get yeah but no this has the aesthetic and technical competence of a fan film from the early 10s yeah you know, one of these heavily green screened kind of lightsaber fight or yeah. Robocop fights Batman or whatever it is, kind of knockoff yeah. thing that would try and fly under the radar to not get a copyright strike. Yeah. It looks like that. It's that's what Snyder's visual language has descended to now, and it's yeah. entirely without worth for me. I mean you could always accuse him of being sort of fascistic yeah. in his use of the camera. You know, and in, in beautifying things that were not meant to be beautified. That was the big complaint leveled at Watchmen. Mm. That, you know, a, movie, uh, a graphic novel that humanizes superheroes couldn't hurt, uh, help but turn back into a story that glorifies superheroes in the hands of someone who yeah. only understands, you know, the camera's uh, sort of, you know, a deification tool. Yeah. 
Uh, and, and but it's not even doing that anymore. It's yeah. just hideous. It's just a melange of of nothing, of just orange smudges. And mm. he does this hideous out of focus thing now, where only the very middle of the frame is in focus, and everything else is this chaotic blur. It just looks horrible. I don't want to look at it. I want to look away from the screen. Yeah, it's it's really demoralizing watching Zack Snyder, who again with all the the power and potential. Uh, not not potential of talent, but potential of um, resources, yeah, um, and yeah. and um, access. Just being able to do this again and again and again, it's very, yeah. it's it's very tiring. It's very tedious. Yeah. <laughs> just not even the movie itself, it just the the event of it, and 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 the the. I feel like the pitch. You know, other than oh, Star Wars for adults, that is, oh, it, like could also be, as far as I can see, this was pitched as Star <clears throat> Wars but sexy, and and the two are interchangeable. Yeah. You know, it, it like, every, but ev- but everyone looks like a a model, or they're incredibly gross, or yeah, you know, like gay coded, and yeah. you know, there's there, there's a lot of overlap with Sandler, and I, I think these two mm. are the the, the sheer nadir of modern cinema. Um, True. Well, it's just, it would figure that the nadir of modern cinema would be sort of the epitome of American kind of excess at the moment. So maybe Armand White is correct and that this is, you know, the perfect sort of, Amer- at the height of American myth- myth-making. Because yeah. Because this really does feel like what Hollywood has to offer the world in broad terms at the moment. <laughs> it, it curr- yeah, it currently does. We've learned nothing of the last <sighs> 10 years. Um, it, it makes yeah. make Michael Bay look like how armageddon sits in my memory (laughs) which is fine oh god um so yeah but yeah it's it's wild um and 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 like you know don't want to be cynical and say oh you know this is just lord of the rings and star wars with other you know huge sci-fi tropes uh yeah lazily flung together um but like i feel like any argument for anything in favor of this film collapses quickly because it, it 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 looks like Hobbiton was plonked down on top of Tatooine, uh, mm. and the influences are so obvious because they're framed in such a way as to stand out. Like the the backstory with Thanos, you know, the Thanos yeah. and Gamora uh, uh, backstory. Uh, mm-hmm. It's like ev- everything is. I'm getting. I'm. 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 Sort of. We've gone a bit macro, and I'm just getting like dwelling on these smaller things now. But mm. I think I'm just interested in Zack Snyder's process because it really looks like he's just dropped in. He, he's sc- sort of square bracketed a bunch of scenes of, oh, you know, like the Green Dragon in scene, but, mm. but different, and then and then done that for a whole bunch of different scenes in this movie, and has 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 worked in that way. And I think, I. I it's cynical, but I think this is an incredibly cynical <laughs> movie. Yeah, um, it, it is. Like, it, it has to be because again, it's back to this Zack Snyder shit of the reluctant Superman who must help whether mm. they want to or not. Yeah. And and there's a way to do this without having, you know, without just drawing comparisons to Jesus the entire mm. time, and and you know, yeah. An amusing rectification of Jesus against conservative mythology. Because the idea that, yes, Jesus sacrificed himself for his sins, but should not have. Because it ultimately made humanity weak for having (laughs) paid its price for it. You know, it's a very confused kind of mythology going on there. But the fact is, it is a cynical enterprise. Because part two, you know, has been released. And Snyder has threatened to make a total of six of these things. The idea being a trilogy that was split in two. Why? Each of them was. I know, and oh. also role-playing games, comics, and a podcast also on the cards. So, <sighs> oh my god, it's a depressing thought. And I, you know, I just I try to think of fictional universes that I've been made to get excited about in my life based on just the first installment. You know, mm. things like I don't know, like Lord of the Rings, Mass Effect, the Culture series by Ian M. Banks, Game of Thrones, yeah, Star Wars, and Marvel at some stage. Yeah, you know those two. So. You know, why would those worlds interest me whilst Rebel Moon repulses me? And, you know, after the film ended, Netflix suggested I watch Dune Part 1 next. 
<laughs> you know, and not and not Rebel Moon Two, hilariously. So, uh, I, I ended up watching the first half hour or so. I thought I'd just watch the beginning, but ended up watching up until the point they arrive on Arrakis. Oh, okay. It's about one o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And in that half hour, you get expository dialogue opening the film yeah. that is grounded in one point of view. Mm-hmm. Then you get the breakfast scene, yeah. which again, delivers more information. All of this does, but yeah. also focuses on character. Yeah. You have the ceremony, you have bonding with Duncan Idaho, you're bonding with dad, the Benny Gesserit scene, packing up and leaving. Yeah. And what really struck me for having managed to get so much information into such a short period mm-hmm. It's just how unhurried it felt yeah. and how much time the film was willing to dedicate to building character relationships. Yeah. You know, and uh, I've seen some people call Dune cold, which, you know, I, I never understand what people mean when they call certain films cold. I always just think you must only be able to respond to sort of Marvel style quipping as character because there's so much warmth yeah. going on between these characters. Dune Part 1 is actually a very warm film, I think. Yeah, I think you so. Know, and, and add to the, at that the fact that Dune is just one of the most aesthetically beautiful films, you know, of the century so far. Yeah. And you just have a story that you can actually get excited about and emotionally connected to and want to see more of. Yeah. And that's what's missing from Rebel Moon is it's just a really terrible start to a franchise because I was desperate to not have to watch any more of it. Yeah, it, it became a point of, it became a form of torture about halfway mm. through where it like, it was just meaning uh not the movie itself was meaningless but the the every minute ceased to f- mean a minute to me it felt every minute felt like mm. an hour yeah. and it was just a sort of unknowable incomprehensible torture um yeah. b- because it yeah it was the same a scene that, well a series of scenes that took about an hour and a half that in yeah. your typical round up a gang of misfits to fight yeah. a bad guy is done in a montage um and there's a there's a reason <laughs> that it's done you know that that's done it would be one thing if picking up this person person one was necessary because you have to have person one in your st- this point yeah. in your script because otherwise they wouldn't have that amazing bit in uh story point two yeah like even the expendables yeah in expendables three when Sly, Sly Stallone is going around picking up guys, the guy he just recruited will say something yeah. when he's recruiting the next person because they're with him. Yeah. And there will be a bit of a change in the dynamic based on the person they've picked yeah. up. It's staggering that there's not a scene where they're all gathered together on the ship. Yeah. You know, just it, rip off Guardians of the Galaxy whilst you're at it. Yeah. It doesn't have to be humorous. It's fine. You don't need humor. I know. In I know you don't have be... the capability for it. You fucking lunatic. <laughs> it can be self serious. There's yeah. nothing wrong with that. But just have them interact in a way that's not just them explaining their backstory, which is not only tedious but it also just makes them really shallow because yeah. maybe they don't want to trust the people around them with their backstory. Maybe they don't want to. Maybe Sophie Batella has been hurt yeah. and doesn't want to just explain her story to everyone she meets. But she does because there's nothing to her. That's just what serves as as character moments in this. And maybe that's why people call Dune cold because in the fir- in the breakfast scene they're not there just talking about um their immediate personalities and their backstories they're trying yeah. and and people d- would rather just be these people specifically would rather just be told the things that are going on but then yeah. even in Re- rebel moon they're not being they're not really being told the important stuff that's going on they're just being given the full backstory it's like fucking yeah. tristram shandy but without any um you know knowingness <laughs> or skill yeah or it is it, <laughs> yeah it is plenty rambling but look <laughs> Snyder is one of the most divisive directors working today, and it's curious to me why I dislike his work so much. Yeah. I have issues with the politics of his film, and he, he actually recently claims to be quite liberal in real life, which almost doesn't surprise me, because mm. he engages in, again, we've talked about it, Jonathan Glazer's, you know, he identified this idea that the camera lens is inherently fascistic, and so mm. it doesn't surprise me that maybe he is a relatively liberal guy in real life yeah. who doesn't understand the impact of the way in which he frames mm people he's engaging with the mechanics of fascism uncritically yeah you know and of course he weaponizes themes like sexual assault who cares none of it means anything it's just surface yeah he's indiscriminate and deeply incurious about the world and 
the potential of cinema. And I think that's why I hate his films. And that's about as concise as I can be on the matter. Yeah, I wish he wasn't divisive. I don't think he deserves to be divisive. It's such a... F- it's such a loaded. Oh, some people love him. But yeah, well, yeah, it's it's such a loaded word. I feel like divisive should be more like. I I don't know. Just Gaspar Noé is divisive, or <laughs> even Michael Bay you think is divisive. divisive. Should... You think divisive should denote some form of quality? Not quality, but just like some some form of integrity, integrity or capability or something. Like Zack Snyder just seems to sit outside in my head. Should be sat like well outside the discussion about divisiveness but you're right yeah like he is mm. it just makes me sad that he is, he yeah. is and it's just not well, you know ignored <laughs> by well everyone. that's what makes that's what makes this big old pudding we call a world all the tastier my friend hope it'll end soon <laughs> <laughs> it'll all be over soon but at the very least at least this can help challenge and potentially reaffirm our beliefs regarding this cinema yeah. In its own ways. Really can't wait you know? to go and see Lestrada. Regardless of how flexible or inflexible we might be, we know at the very least at this stage in our lives, we just can't fucking stand Rebel Moon. So let's quick fire. It took us 37 years, but I realised. Quick fire. I like the tune over the title reveal. Yes, that's my first one as well. It's nice and atmospheric. Yeah, if I remember correctly, it was like an acoustic guitar kind of thing combined mm. with a bit of sci-fi synth, and I think that matches the tone yeah. that they were going for relatively well. There was a lovely space this rumble sort of... in there. Yeah, yeah, this kind of space Americana. Mm. <laughs> um, you know, the, the the music video shots, the hand running across the ground, the slow-mo dropping of seeds, etc. You know, they they look nice. Oh, yeah. They look nice. And a nice, well, like nice is as, as far as praiseworthy as I'm gonna be on that. I think um, more than fair. Hmm. I think it's more than this deserves, but yet is also speaks well of you, sad to say. Thanks, mate. I like. Okay, so the conversation between them and the Nazis had a relative amount of tension. You know, they're cranking up the tune and all the rest mm. of it. I think it was Tom Holkenberg who did the music for this. Oh, Don't which know who is that perverse. Is. Um, that's Junkie XL. Oh, yeah, boy. And yeah, there's um, but the one little twist of dialogue that I quite liked is that uh, Corey Stoll argues when the Nazi observes how abundant the fields are that the overplanting is evidence of how short they are of supplies because they, the crops fail so regularly they have to plant more than they need mm. knowing that most of it will die. Um. And that's a little bit of like logic he used there to try and get out of a situation that was good. Oh yeah, cool. And it helps build the tension because you think maybe he will manage to get out of this. Uh, yeah, I, I... Weirdly, I don't know why I went to this, but my point of reference for tension during this scene was the... um. The scene in Django Unchained when they're in Leo DiCaprio's colonial oh, house, sure. um, you know, yeah. before everything goes silly. Um, yeah, it was. It, I was reminded oh, I... of that tension, and uh, yeah. So I mean, fair enough, Tarantino, because one hundred percent, he was thinking of the farmhouse sequence from Inglorious Bastards when he wrote this. Yeah, when they wrote this, that's definitely the the inspiration. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, and it, mm. yeah, it that came across well, and there was. Um, there was a, there was a good dynamic in there during that sort of that farmhouse interrogation scene, um, mm. when uh, when Blando mentions, oh I I I called uh, Corey Stoll yeah Skyrim. Uh, so when when oh, okay. uh, Blando mentions Skyrim, Ed Screen mm. turns and gives Skyrim a real simpering, knowing look. Like a like a oh, thing yeah. of recognition, touching the nose and pointing yeah. at him, sort of look, which was fun. And it yeah. was yeah, again, it was kind of uh, it's Christoph Waltz esque. Oh yeah, uh, in there. So yeah, it it, it was play f- a bit playful and helped with that tense. It helped with the tense feeling of that scene. 
So yeah. that was probably, yeah, probably the most scene illiterate moment in the movie. Could well be. Whoa! Oh, God. Yeah. Um, When there's a massive crowd discussion about what to do and somebody says, but, you know, uh, Skyrim, he argued for this, but somebody else just says, he's dead now. <laughs> this is your fault, Gunnar! I didn't know that he would kill them. This man really? is dead now. What are we going to do about the soldiers in the granary? No, I Barry? That. that was dumb. Yeah. <laughs> um, he's dead. Remember? Do you remember that? Oh. That's gross. I forgot he was dead. Um, oh, yeah. Actually, you're right. That's not going to work. <laughs> With him being dead. There was some good... There was some decent CGI in there that reminded me of District 9 era Weta. But not that good. Ooh. But quite good. Not that good. Well, yes. But quite good. Um, Spider Lady, Jenna Malone. Yeah. I'm glad they did that with practical effects. Yeah. Not that... It good. It looked good on her. Not, not that I could tell, listeners, because uh, everything looks so polished and sheeny. Michael Sheeny. And yet grainy and out of focus as well. It's a perplexing, baffling situation. A bold level of confusion that Zack Snyder is ushering us into. Reflective of the era of confusion that America is in right now. I did like pre-antlery Botkins running away from doing a oh, murder yeah. with a flower wreath in his head. Oh, yeah. that's Yes, That's the, the, the meshing of... Yeah, the meshing of natural and uh, synthetic work quite well with him, I think. Yes, especially like when he's design. running away from a murder. Yeah, the design reminded me of um, who was it? it Taika Waititi in uh, no, was it Alan Tudyk in Rogue One? Oh, sure. The uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, fair enough. I think he had a slight clockworky feel that put it made him reminiscent of quite a, a sort of Hellboy kind of creation. Uh, okay, that's nice. I liked the snow battle. In the, one of the flashbacks that she has, mm. it's uh, probably the only moment of action that uh, I found visually interesting or engaging. Mm, okay, yeah. and it's it's and it happens because a character that we're told was important to the main character dies. Oh yeah, they'll probably come good. back in the second one. Have you seen the second one? Hope not. No. Yeah. Will good for you. Handle that later on. <laughs> Great. Um... Yay! Got to find out how it ends, mate. Oh. I have got to now, actually. Um, yeah. Not Go for on. any professional you curiosity, but we've got to finish this off. The fans are going to... They're, they're like, oh, more of this energy, please. Uh, <laughs> more sleepy pulls. <laughs> oh, I, I got conversation going on interspersed with the captured in the robot guy wailing was funny. So when they when they get to that Western Mandalorian town, um, just before they encounter oh, yeah. the pub pervert, um, they're having a conversation, pub Blandor pervert. and Glistening Lass, about where to find the next mm. scene. And um, there's a <laughs> yeah. guy in that like that interrogation robot thing, which is very cool. Yeah, he uh, <laughs> there's a guy in that, and it like in- it's for interrogation, and there's a little like spike that goes into the back of your head and and all that. And oh, yeah. um, there was a, there was a guy in the background wailing, and it was into like interjecting. <laughs> it was invading, <laughs> impinging on the conversation that the two main characters are having, uh, and yeah. it was quite amusing. It was quite amusing. Yeah. I like that. Ah, oh, yes. Um, oh, the cockship looked quite good. Oh. You know, it had a good spaceship kind of design. It was reminiscent of the uh, Starship Troopers spaceship design, yeah. which I think is quite iconic. I haven't seen that in so long, mate. It's been a long time, mate. But I can imagine when I see it again, I'm going to be like, iconic! Iconic! I remember that ship design! Mm. But my boyhood. That's from That's My Boy. <laughs> for my boyhood DVD, which was the trailer for <laughs> which Rick, for some reason, <laughs> Richard Linklater was throwing out, throwing away, a care mode life. Love that. <laughs> um, your turn. Uh, oh, okay. Oh, well, in that case, mm. I think I just had cock ship, didn't I? Yeah. Oh, you did. Ooh. I apologise. So well, there you go. Um, or no, or was I just captured in the robot, interspersed balloons claw? Point. I think I did cockship after that, but okay. only the edit will tell. Meanwhile, I'll talk about Duna Bay's hat. Ooh! Duna Bay had a sort of uh, bloodborne looking hat, Ooh. which uh, mm. I thought was rather nice. I was thinking it, yeah. I was just about to say Elden Ring, so. Uh, so uh, no, bloodborne! Yes. Uh, well, it's some sort of From Software y sort of nightmare. fellow. Yeah. Um, yeah. I liked the parasite alien that fed off and communicated through the guy in the bar. 
Yes, as an idea that was interesting and brought a bit of life to what was otherwise just a sort of Star Wars cantina knockoff. Yes, exactly. That was. Uh, I didn't get to share all of my incredible plot notes uh, that I definitely spent too much time on <laughs> instead of watching the movie. Um, but yeah, the 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 Star Wars <laughs> cantina, Mandalorian cantina, cantina note. Um, that was a that was a genuinely yeah. surprising bit of imagery and storytelling. Yeah. So, well done. Well done to everyone who was involved in that. Should have mentioned that in uh, the praise section of ooh, my thoughts. Love that. Well, this is kind of a praise section, anyways. That's true. I'm never the gonna anonymous one. I'm never gonna lead with positives ever again. Because look at uh, positives <laughs> right here. Uh, we've Write done that. Oh, when they first introduced Jamon Hounsou and mm. he gets to his le- gets to his feet, gets mm. to his legs. That's what people say. <laughs> get your legs, son. We're getting out. Of here. Get your leg. Get um, your legs, Hounsou. He, Hamzu, get in here. So, yeah, he looked great. He's got a fucking great body. Fuck he's yeah. looking good, and he's really lean and sort of tight. It was great. Loved it. Yeah, I love his his like dusty face, his dusty drunk face, and when he's woken up, yeah. his big wide eyes open, and it's just I so just liked him as a big jarring. That's great. I just enjoyed him for being a big buff boy. Big buff, Jaimon boy. Uh, big Buffy boy. I quite like Charlie Hunnam's look. He looked like it, it was it was like um, homeless Aragorn, but who'd found a tarpaulin coat. Um, it was like Homer Aragorn. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. I, I I thought he looked pretty cool, and I liked I like Charlie Hunnam in his now I'm going to be in every film with long hair and a beard uh, phase. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> Epoch. Uh, and it was pretty good in here. I don't know if his accent yeah. was very good. Uh, no, it, probably not. It was. It was. It was what an English person thinks a Northern Irish person sounds like, uh, but with English person pronun- enunciation at the ends of the words as well. Yeah. Um, but he did say, "Ah, yeah, bollocks," and that's always that's always <laughs> fun. I like it when Irish people and you all say this every day. They've all said it, ah, and they'll all say it again when they see this film. As well as, I'm, um, I'm never listening to OGT again, they say. That's that's what they often say. I was very affected by <gasps> the Squidman. And I think the reason being mm-hmm. is he shows up, and he looks quite good, and he's got his little pointy eyes, and he's got his, his voice, and it just puts me in mind of like a Sarah creation. Aww. And I remember being in the cinema, and him showing up and thinking, oh Christ, he's not going to last. <laughs> He's going to be killed in some sort of utterly performative moment of cruelty that Snyder fucking cynically imbues in, in, in all of yeah. his things because only badasses may live. This, you know, and yeah. no, there's no poets <laughs> or beautiful people in Snyderverse no, at any stage. Not even a Gurney Halleck warrior poet. No, no, they'll die. They'll die because they were weak. Yeah. It's a really disgusting view of the world, I find. Um,. So yeah, I was affected by that because I knew he was going to die, and then he died yeah. whimpering, and it was very upsetting. And that's my last one. Oh, okay. is that <laughs> Yay! I was affected by the fact that Snyder killed the nice squid man, Barry Untermensch. Yeah. Ah, oh, God. Well, listen. Never mind that, kids, because uh, Carrie Elwes in a flashback is sporting an amusing fake beard. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! And he's saying something. Oh, yes. Wide eyed, like wide eyed. Uh, you can't hear what he's saying because of the backstory noise. Uh, oh, and yeah. the combination all of that was very good and I paused it and showed Nell uh, <laughs> Nell Nell come and look at this I know you don't want to be here anymore um, <laughs> Cyborg Australia. said Dreadnought of the Mother World um, in an interesting Ooh. way and then I looked him up and went <laughs> Cyborg oh, oh dear um, what are you doing here I didn't see Hunnam's betrayal coming probably because of the apathy okay but, uh, <laughs> a sheer lack of interest. Yeah, yeah exactly. Oh, okay. I just—I <laughs> think I just didn't think the film had it in it um, <laughs> to do a thing. Yeah, to have a story. Um, yeah, and then uh, the exchange between uh, Glistening Lass and uh, Charlie Hunnam. Uh, what happened to Honor? Gosh, she glistened. What did happen to it? Just the 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 <laughs> um, emphasis on did made yeah. it a really interesting delivery. I liked it. Um, I th- love that. Love. And then, yeah, the robot uh, an- Antlery Botkins. Was Antlery Botkins. Good vibe at the end. It, that scene felt like it should be a scene. Actually, it was quite similar to Vickers at the end of District 9. Uh, just oh, as yeah. the alien, just looking around. Just fucking around with his with flower. Box. 
with his metal flower or whatever. Yeah. Fucking whatever. Oh, fuck yeah. off. Um, whatever the fuck. I don't care. Fucking... I'm just saying words now. I don't mean fuck off. I didn't, wouldn't mean that at all. <laughs> what am I saying? Uh, but yeah, it was a similar sort of pensive, quiet moment uh, that made me go, ooh, I wonder how this is yeah. going to be ruined. <laughs> so yeah. I wonder how this can be cynically employed to make me hate the Nazis more. Because I could hate uh, them more, mate. I do, I do fucking love that ultimately this came down to a battle between Nazis and Vikings. <laughs> I wish and that... I can't wait to see which yeah. Master Race wins out in the next instalment. <sighs> it's got to be one of them. Oh! That's what I'm here for. And that's going to do it for us, so let's check in with the OG team. And I can tell you right now that Jenny Sohn's gone to... <gasps> Jenny! And it's very hard for me to care about anything else right now, because Jenny Sohn... That's fair. Snyder really is giving his all to world building, and somehow he can attract a fun cast. I'm not sure if it all meshes. The hat on Nemesis looks pretty cool. Agreed on the hat. <laughs> agreed on... I think agreed on the cool cast. He certainly had some interesting cameos. He got some good people for a day. Hmm. One thing we didn't get into is I did think Sophie Patella was terrible in this. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, she really unassertive, often seeming quite afraid of the camera, and just really unconvincing as any kind of anything really i just feel like this is Zack snyder i like i'm, I'm yeah. fully willing to blame Zack snyder for this looks oh, sadder sure. looks sadder please <laughs> it's always important to blame Zack snyder that is it for the og team thank you very much jennifer sons you'll thank never you. know how much we appreciate it jenny how much do we appreciate her? About... very very and now it's time for the og better thing <laughs> <laughs> The one better thing. All the movies this ripped off, and also Dune, to which probably came out faster than this movie could rip off, and also Furiosa, because Furiosa is great. Go see it. And Andor. Please go see it. You should go see it. I will. It's It's got a very limited yeah. showing at the fucking um, IMAX in uh, Melbourne. Because soon... Not doing as well as it might. Because soon we must make way for whatever Bad Boys movie it is. Oh, no. Oh, God. What... No, no, you've no. got to see it at the IMAX. I don't want... Everybody, Australia, go. Go now. It's, like, it's, it's gone in like th- three days, and I'm seeing La Strada. Go, do, do a double bill. <laughs> I have to cancel work. It's the way George Miller in, in, intended. <sighs> it's so good in IMAX. I saw it at the BFI. It's staggering. I'm going to go see it again at the BFI if I can. Good. You should listen to Quest What's Fantastic Season thing? 2. Yeah, uh, it's a space western. It's sad, but funny and good, and with good storytelling. And are you doing quest fantastic? Is your one better thing? Uh, well, I'd already done Andor. I did mention Andor. Oh, I heard Andor come up. Yeah, but I heard yeah. Blandor right. a few times as well, mate. Oh, um, that was the one better thing. The one better thing. Okay, how could Paul? How can people find out about this? All of this? How can Paul All indeed? Uh, Twitter and Facebook at OGT Pod. <laughs> you can become a patron where we put up uh, all three of these places. We put out the call for the OG team. So if you've seen one of these movies, oh. such as Rebel Moon Part Two, Scar Giver, oh. Rebel Moon, no. Rebel Moon One Part Two, <laughs> Scar Giver, <laughs> soon to have Christ. four more movies. You massive cunt. Fuck me. Um, then yeah, oh. OGT Pod. We put out the call for the OG team. So if you've seen Rebel Moon Two, Scar Giver, uh, you can. Get in touch there to tell us your good things, such as the one given to us by Jenny, whom we appreciate Jenny. very much. Um, oh, yeah. And, and, yeah, you can see more of us with your ears on Jenny the Film Critic or Quest Fantastic. Yeah. Um, and in your dreams. Yeah, sorry about that, by I'm, the way. Yeah, that's a shame. I'm Paulie Kruger. I'm Dream Paulia. Oh, fuck yeah. Do you remember those movies? Let's talk about those next time. <laughs> right now. And remember, the one good thing about Rebel Moon is that watching it really can give you a little bit of an insight into where you are on the whole spectrum of blockbuster mo- movies at the moment. In other words, are you on the wrong side of history? <laughs>